Okay, why don't we get into it? Um, so for those who just joined, welcome to our weekly discovery session, uh, Efficiency Canada, something we do every Friday at noon, where we like to showcase great things happening across the country uh, related to energy efficiency. And we're very, very lucky today to have uh, Fatima Kriars, our uh, VP of Partnerships and Strategy at the Atmospheric Fund based in Toronto. Um, and, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of hype around this session. Uh, Fatima was uh, trying to get it going a few weeks back and, uh, and it didn't work out. And so we rescheduled it and lots of people were emailing us like, where's that session? So there's some pent up demand for what uh, Fatima is going to talk about related to kickstarting Canada's retrofit economy. And um, yeah, as way of introduction, Fatima is uh, an old pal of mine. And, and, and for those who have been in the energy efficiency sector, likely run into her um, throughout the years over the past uh, couple of decades. Uh, Fatima is a force and uh, she's doing great work with her colleagues at the Atmospheric Fund and great work bringing the sector together around multiple different areas um, and just a great positive force for everyone. So I think you'll all agree with me when to see her start to speak. Um, and um, as per usual with these sessions, we do um, uh, about 20 minutes of, uh, of a presentation that Fatima will give, but we really want uh, the, the core value of these sessions to be around um, the Q&A. And so if you have a question, there are two places to do it. You can do it in the Q&A button, which is at the bottom right, or in the chat as you're uh, hearing or want to discuss with others. And I'll sort of kind of organize them based around themes and ask them. Um, and uh, so we'll do that for the last kind of 20, 25 minutes. The one rule, as always, with this session is uh, both with presenters and with uh, uh, people asking questions, there are no sales pitches allowed. So please keep your questions and your chats um, open to uh, points of clarification or strategic questions that you may have for the presenter. So let's get right into it. So Fatima, it's all yours. Take it away. Thanks so much, Corey. I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here. Like Corey said, this is take two. So thanks and, and apologies to anyone who, who uh, tried to come into session number one. Um, I'm excited to share uh, what we're working on at TAF right now when, when it comes to retrofits and thinking bigger about retrofits. Um, I always love a good discovery session, a good brainstorm session, because there are a ton of good ideas out there. And so as we develop this idea and incubate it, I'm really looking forward to the conversation at the end to uncover new areas we need to think through. So I'll spend a couple of minutes telling you about the Atmospheric Fund and then I'll dive into the idea. But I wanted to make sure everyone knew who the organization was. Uh, and so this picture is, um, is, a, is a property that was sold by the City of Toronto many years ago to create an endowment fund. And this endowment fund is what launched the Atmospheric Fund. The Atmospheric Fund is Canada's first uh, municipal climate agency. Our mandate is to deliver GHG, greenhouse gas emissions reductions, uh, initially in the city of Toronto and today in the greater Toronto Hamilton area. And what's amazing is that the, that fund that was put aside, um, we have not drawn on any public money. And in fact, through those dollars, we've been able to deliver 24 megatons in annual emissions reductions. Um, and, you know, I always say, and so for anyone who knows me well, like the money is out there to do the climate action work that we need to do. It's just deployed the wrong way. And so I'm really proud to be representing TAF today. We were founded in 1991 and we invest in urban climate solutions in the GTHA dedicated to reducing carbon emissions and air pollution. Uh, we have four streams of work. We do policy advocacy work. We do impact investing. We do grant making. And, uh, we, and we do program delivery, program incubation and delivery, and that's the area I'm going to talk about today. As TAF has grown over the last almost 30 years, on the left of this slide, you see the area that we're responsible for right now. Our job is to deliver emissions reductions in the greater Toronto Hamilton area, which is where approximately 50% of Ontarians live today. There are 25 municipalities in the region and approximately 20% of Canada's population. And on the right hand side, we're really proud to now be joining a network of similar municipal, agent, uh, municipal climate agencies across the country. TAF is a founding member of the LC3 network, that's Low Carbon Cities Canada, and we'll now have the benefit of working with colleagues in Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Ottawa, Montreal, and Halifax to bring ideas, exchange knowledge, and, uh, and get climate action going even faster. One of the things that every person at TAF, we fondly call, to, we call ourselves TAFers, 
uh, remind ourselves when we're making decisions, when we're talking about strategy, is to always follow the carbon. And, um, and so if you look at the carbon emissions, this is the inventory for the Greater Toronto Hamilton area, our strategic focus is on buildings. And the work I'm going to share with you today is built on probably over almost a decade of experience across the organization at looking at how we reduce emissions in the building sector. This is what we think about. With 44% of greenhouse gas emissions coming from buildings and about 12% across the country, we're asking ourselves, how do we retrofit, upgrade and electrify all these homes and buildings on what I call a climate relevant pace and a climate relevant scale? Don't even look at this slide, look out the window and ask yourself that question. There are phenomenal projects out there, researching, piloting, demonstrating the efficacy, the, the different approaches, the business cases for uh, energy efficiency retrofits, deep energy efficiency retrofits. But we really have to start asking ourselves, how do we get to all homes and buildings? And so that's the question um, that I'm hoping to try to shed some light on, or at least tell you how we're thinking about it here at the Atmospheric Fund. Um, as Corey mentioned, the name of the talk is Kickstarting Canada's Retrofit Economy. So I'll start with what many of you on the call likely already know. Retrofits do deliver. They deliver energy efficiency. We can see the carbon reductions. They mobilize significant economic activity. They create jobs and they deliver tangible health benefits. As I mentioned, TAP has about 10 years of growing experience. Most recently, we did a suite of uh, buildings in, um, with Toronto Community Housing, public housing here in multi-unit residential buildings. We uh, included indoor environmental quality improvements that improved uh, from the tenant's perspective, quality of their sleep and quality of comfort in the winter. We know they deliver. We are among such a huge network of uh, implementers across the country who are doing um, energy efficiency retrofits and electrification retrofits today. So the, the evidence is already there. The problem is they're not scaling, right? In spite of the business cases and the, the white papers, the case studies here locally uh, and in the GTHA and across Canada, but also across the world in Europe and in the United States, um, there are projects out there, but why aren't they scaling? And so if you start on the right hand side, today we have many small scale disaggregated but successful building retrofit programs. And on the left, we know that by 2050 or sooner, we need to have net zero homes and buildings for all. They need to be affordable. They need to be climate resilient. They need to be healthy places to live, play and work. And we envision an economy built with green jobs, good jobs for everyone. The gap when it comes to building retrofits are many. Financing gaps, the risk associated with these, the uncertainty, well, are these measures going to deliver the energy savings and bill reductions I expect to see? Building owner interests, these are large, complicated projects. Um, you know, if you've ever managed a renovation before or even taken your car to a mechanic, you know that there's that spot where your ability to define the problem and that expert's ability to describe the solution leaves, it, leaves a gap. And when you look at a multi million dollar retrofit, project that's going to span a number of months or years and touch you know hundreds of tenants and residents that you're accountable for that starts to become an insurmountable challenge we also have a gap around sector capacity um, we're really proud to be working with efficiency canada and many other partners on the workforce 2030 uh, on the workforce 2030 project which is all about increasing the trades and skills around green retrofits but also at the industrial level, you know, there's products and services that we have the opportunity to bring to market, but today we don't have enough demand for. And so we're in this critical period where we want to start advancing deep energy retrofits, but we need to be able to access great services and products to be able to implement them. And then there are social aspects as well that are critical. We have to be able to deliver these high quality retrofits while protecting affordability of homes and buildings and making sure that they're done in an equitable way as well to the communities and people who need them the most. And this is an example just to illustrate the kind of challenges that we're facing. When we talk about the traditional business case for retrofits. There are on the bottom of the screen, you'll see reduced maintenance costs, which appear on the bill, increased income because the property becomes more attractive and valuable, energy savings and increased property values, uh, property values. The challenge is that the other benefits that we know are achievable are non monetizable today, and that includes the climate impacts that we must deliver. There's climate impacts, social equity, 
health and well-being, avoided energy infrastructure, employment, employment opportunities, and resilience to changing weather. These are public benefits today that don't appear in a traditional business case for retrofits. And yet, we're really proud of the acknowledgement um, by many, I'm sure, stakeholders who are on the call today, Efficiency Canada. More and more people, uh, more and more politicians, both locally and across the world, are recognizing that investing in green infrastructure and in green construction carries the kind of stimulus scale opportunity that we need to come out of this pandemic and build back better. On average, 18 jobs are created per every million dollars that are spent on energy efficiency. And if we just look at the multi-unit residential buildings sector in Canada, there are over 4 million suites. That's 4 million condos and apartments in Canada that need to be retrofitted in, in every corner, in every city, in every community. And we need to achieve an average minimum of a 40% carbon improvement per suite. And so our early estimates, when we allowed ourselves to really dream about the massive potential here, is that there's almost a quarter trillion dollars in opportunity, in economic activity. And so investing in retrofits carries that promise and we're seeing more and more acknowledgement of that. So when we ask ourselves, what will it take to really uh, deliver this effectively, deliver high quality retrofits and deploy that capital uh, in the way that we envision, we sort of see this three-legged stool, right? On one hand, to deliver retrofits at scale, at a climate re relevant pace, we are going to need a regulatory framework. We are going to need to move from voluntary incentives and into places where we have benchmarks and standards that the building sector has to meet over time. And we really admire the work that's being done in New York where they've taken that approach. We also recognize that there's going to need to be sustainable financing and a holistic mix of financing. When you think back to that table, I or that, that image that I showed you about the, the, the difference in the public and private benefits, we're going to need a mix of capital that's both commercial capital that's expecting rates of return in that seven to 10 year sweet spot, as well as patient capital that can come from the public sector and from community investments to invest in those aspects that include safety, health and accessibility and other public benefits. And the third leg of the stool is around implementation. What I have said here on the slide is centralized services. As I mentioned, a big barrier to great and effective deep energy retrofits is in getting the projects done, getting the projects done well and making sure post project that we're still achieving the savings that we expect. And that's where I wanna dive in a little more. Our idea that I'm excited to share with you today is called working title, Retrofit Delivery Centers. What we're envisioning is the idea of a new kind of agency. And this agency would be all about retrofit implementation. This would be a local agency dedicated to a geographic area and maybe a very specific building segment that's publicly funded to see those retrofits through and spur that market activity, get those dollars spent into market, get the construction activity scoped and get the, get the dollars into, into jobs. This would be a one-stop shop that centralizes all the services that building owners need to be able to access and remains accountable, and this part is critical, for social and environmental outcomes. That can't be decoupled from the retrofit itself. Social and environmental outcomes can't be treated as trade-offs. And right now, so long as we're just putting value on that economic rate of return, we're gonna keep putting pressure on, those carbon, uh, on the carbon emissions impacts that we need to see. And so when we ask ourselves, well, how would this agency operate? Today, we believe the agency could be any kind of organization. It could be a for-profit, it could be a not-for-profit, it could be a social enterprise, it could even be inside a utility. But the idea and what the agency does is really specific. And so on this slide, I'm gonna describe five core principles, part of the agenda of these agencies. The first is that a retrofit delivery center has to be committed to delivering a high degree of service and quality. The agency has to make sure that home and building owners can access exactly what they need to get deep energy retrofits done and done well and done well with confidence. That includes financing, materials and services, equipment and skills. The second is that we cannot take our eye off the emissions reductions. We need to achieve a minimum of 40% carbon improvements on track for net zero. And that has to be part of the, of the crux of the agenda. Third, positive social outcomes. Again, not trade-offs, not optionalities. 
when we start a big capital project like a retrofit, that's the time to integrate more than the energy outcomes that we need to see, more than the carbon impacts that we're trying to achieve. We need to talk about health and safety and accessibility outcomes. We need to engage residents and look at community development opportunities, as well as local job creation targets. And we think an agency that's working in the public's interest can have that mandate so that that's part of the strategy. The fourth is sustainable financing. A retrofit delivery center would be directly involved in making sure that building owners can access and secure and structure financing deals for those retrofit projects, including that mix of capital. And fifth, these agencies would be directly accountable to the public and would meet high governance standards. The job would be to continuously evaluate and report on the retrofits that are being completed and on the social, environmental and economic outcomes that need to be delivered. The reason why we're excited about this idea for this new kind of agency is suddenly we take those challenges and we turn them into opportunities. By talking in big numbers, we start to acknowledge the pace at which retrofits needs to get done. In, at TAF, we work specifically on multi-unit residential buildings. And even within that segment, we have focused in on public housing units specifically. But if you look at the number of multi-unit residential buildings in the greater Toronto Hamilton area, which is our jurisdiction, we would need to be delivering retrofits on approximately 44,000 apartments and units every single year to get to all of the buildings uh, in the GTHA, just in the multi-unit residential building sector. That is a lot of activity. And we need to put that big, hairy number in front of us to remind ourselves how fast we need to be able to move. Second, this takes that tension away from the construction and engineering aspects of this that are starting to get more and more expensive on the projects and the social and environmental priorities that we know we need to achieve. By putting them together and holding one agency accountable for that triple bottom line, we avoid decoupling them and reduce that pressure. It also creates local economic opportunity. At the end of the day, implementing a retrofit is inherently on site, on the ground. And so by having an agency that's keeping social outcomes in mind, you start to be able to take advantages. I mean, nearly a million people in Ontario lost their employment as a result of COVID-19. We can be really deliberate working through campaigns like Workforce 2030, as well as others, to start uh, targeting whom we're hiring, what we're hiring them for, and creating the confidence that there are going to be the jobs out there because we've got this pipeline of retrofits that we need to deliver. That leads me to my fourth point, that by thinking at a climate relevant scale, and by looking at all the retrofits that need to be done, and by using that regulatory framework, we can start to send the signals that the market needs to see, both to get the job done, but also keep us competitive. We don't need those professional skills and the materials to be offshore. We can have those locally. And so by, by sending a strong and clear signal on the retrofit scale we need to achieve, we start to position ourselves as a leader. And the fifth one is critical. By implementing or putting together this kind of agency model, we avoid disaggregating these projects. It creates an opportunity to put them all together and look at volume based strategies, whether that's on procurement, whether that's on financing, whether that's on standardizing processes that allow us to go much faster than working on individual projects uh, separately. And that's a wrap. I'd love to hear questions. Um, I've got a ton more to say. I didn't dive into detail on everything. I'll do my best to answer questions, but I'd also really welcome the participants on today's call to share their ideas. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Great, thank you, Fatima. We've got an, uh, <clears throat> a number of questions already uh, kind of coming through. So for those who are came in a little bit late, there's a Q&A button just on the bottom of your screen. Feel free to um, not only ask a question, but you can also hit the um, thumbs up button and that um, just uh, essentially adds a like to someone else's question and uh, makes it more relevant. So uh, first question actually is about um, questions related to PACE and PACE, PACE funding programs. Uh, Nirwar asked, you know, would, could do you have any, can you shed any light on why Canada may be lagging behind other jurisdictions around the world? Um, related to PACE programming, and I know that um, maybe you can talk through sort of, you know, the, the latest, if you know, about FCM's program. So anything about how this could, uh, the work you're doing here can be connected to advancing uh, PACE-related PACE programs. For sure. 
Um, I'm not enough of an expert to be able to, to compare Canada to global jurisdictions, but one of the things that for sure we've acknowledged at the Atmospheric Fund is that there are a lot of different financial tools that are out there. And right now we want to be able to cast a wide net and, and examine them. We've got an energy savings performance agreement model that we use at TAF on different projects. And by creating an agency like an RDC, we are much more nimble on being able to structure the kinds of deals. A, lot, a, a big part of the challenge that we're facing is that the market is in development. And so the work that needs to get done today, for example, is on financing strategy with, with models like PACE and SBUS and others. Over time, those will start to get standardized. And as they get standardized, we can move to focus in on, on different areas. Great. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, Sarah Buchanan asked just, um, uh, well, first she loves the idea um, and uh, just ask any insight into how kind of in, to ensure that local communities can help guide the work. Um, you know, there's, there's centers at, at the neighborhood level or agencies that deliver things. Um, how would they fit into to this model? I think they're critical. I think it's really exciting when you think about working community by community on the buildings and homes that people live, work and play in. We are including more and more resident engagement strategies on the ground. Um, I think that there's a huge energy literacy opportunity when it comes to thinking this way. Uh, the challenge right now is that we separate all of these components and it really depends on the quality of the delivery agent, whether or not communities are engaged. That's why we're so pumped about this public interest approach and having a mandate around that so that it becomes part of the expectation and when we looked at this idea we asked ourselves how would you know how big of an agency are we asking how many of them will we need and that's part of what we're trying to experiment with right now and that's why it was exciting to be on today's call because based on our numbers when you look at the economic flow through that you would create by putting together an agenda for retrofits Running an agency like this is less than half a percent of the total economic value. It's an extremely, extremely cost effective area to put resources and creates a ton of additional value on the retrofit itself. Yeah, indeed. Um, just before we get to the next question, Fatima, there was just a, a comment. If we could stop sharing your screen, oh, that way they can see both our yeah. lovely faces or at least one nice face. Um, so the next question I'm kind of bundling together is um, uh, a question that, that I've, I've been thinking of as well, which is related to, you know, one of the greatest things TAF does is they, they seed something and then they scale up. And so there were a couple questions related to, you know, what are the next steps to kind of taking this delivery center, making it a reality in the GTHA, and then scaling it up, you know, is this something you're going to help pilot beyond the GTHA and potentially a national level? Yeah, 100%. This is a very much please steal this idea or elements of it kind of approach. Um, you know, this, the idea for the RDC builds on uh, work that my colleagues at TAF have done long before I joined the organization. And what we're trying to do right now is, is talk about the model. Uh, and we're trying to raise money to run this model for three years, right? This isn't a one off. This isn't a short term pilot. We want to be able to uh, commit to this build that funnel of retrofit projects, start to aggregate, start to look at how you make procurement go faster, attract the right kind of partners to it. And um, so, you know, knowledge transfer is going to be huge for us, but that could start right now. I mean, if, you, if you're from an organization and this is resonating with you, I'd be happy to talk about it right now. We have a, a white paper on this that we could share. Um, and the last thing I'll say on that too, is we definitely have already started dialogues with our partners in the LC3 network. Uh, to share this idea with other regions across Canada. Great. So what's the next step? So so I know you guys have this concept of the structure set up and you're you're actively kind of talking about it as much as possible. Is there kind of an immediate kind of, you know, in the next six to eight weeks where you see the retrofit center getting set up? And then how do other actors get involved in it? For example, utilities or local governments or industry who want to kind of bring other maybe incentives or money or things to it. What's what's the plan there? plan. I love it, Corey. So for sure, I mean, we've got a pipeline of retrofit projects that we're working on right now. And our team this morning, just as, just as recently as this morning, was thinking about how do we start approaching these projects and delivering them with scale in mind. So, you know, an example, an example of that is standardizing our procurement process, right? Uh, and looking at all the steps that we need to take and the approaches we need to take and asking ourselves, you know, how long does this take? How, how much faster can we go? How can we increase the quality? Another small, uh, small, huge 
uh, change we're trying to make is rather than thinking uh, building sites to building sites or you know these three or four buildings at once and then those three or four buildings at once how do you start to strike a portfolio level partnership how do you work with a property owner you know and, and building managers and understand where they're coming from in terms of their capital upgrades and then weave in the idea of committing to retro Fits, so that we reduce negotiation time. I mean, our experience has been that negotiating retrofits and building those partnerships can take as long as the retrofit itself. We don't have that kind of time. So to answer your question, um, we're trying to start with this thinking right now. And I would encourage anyone else who's, who's implementing retrofits or planning them or looking at pilots, you know, put those notes together. Ask yourself, where do we need to be able to go faster and what's holding us back? Yeah, and, I, and I've seen, you know, in other models, one of um, one thing I know that, that you guys have looked at is um, uh, in, in the U.S., the Connecticut Green Bank has set up similar type of structure as part of its financing. And one of the great values of that to the end user is that they get to bring utility incentives and potentially other economic development incentives that may be around or, or tax treatments and things like that alongside the things that the Connecticut Green Bank would offer through you know different financing options and plus the the retrofit so i could see or i guess that's the question is that is that kind of how you you see this also playing out is potentially working with you know utilities embridge iso potentially if there's federal economic recovery to kind of bring those directly to the end user exactly Cool. Exactly. And, uh, you know, that's also one of the, we have to acknowledge that, that uh, those funding programs are there, but our experience has shown that even when financing is available, building owners and managers still have a hard time getting off the ground, getting retrofit uh, projects off the ground. Oftentimes they have to make a financial uh, commitment just in the form of benchmarking, auditing, just to access that capital. And so a big role of this agency is to know what funding is available, how to access it and support the, uh, support the proposal writing process of it. Great. I also love, you know, New York is taking a different approach right now. New York is really looking at service providers and product manufacturers and asking them, what are the tipping points that they need to see? What's the size of order or the scale of business that they need to see to be able to come and make investments in that local market? And they're really focusing on a cost compression strategy then. So if we can get you know this many orders or commit to this much volume, how do we rapidly reduce the cost of retrofits? And is that, that's the, as someone asked, that's the retrofit accelerator program in New York City? Is that that project or is that something else? Track of all the working titles, but it's with the group inside NYSERDA. Okay. Great. So Matthew asked that question. Maybe you can type that in if that's what your uh, understanding was. Um, and then another question just related to other models, because certainly TAF isn't the only one trying to figure this out um, across Canada, but also jurisdictions around the world. Um, Raiden asks, you know, that there's been some studies around, you know, why only a one-stop shop model? Donald Brown has outlined that the, the uh, what's called a managed energy service model or an energy service agreement may be a better model. So like more of those energy performance contracts. I don't see those kind of, I see the, see the retrofit delivery center almost like being an umbrella for multiple different kinds of solutions based on what that end user needs. Is that kind of how you see it as well? Totally. Uh, I'm trying to remember the first name. The first name I think we had was concierge. And the reason we, we were sort of using that as the concept was really about implementation. It was really about bridging the gap between all the different aspects that a building owner needs to be able to access and helping them get it. So that white glove level service so that they have one point of contact, they have a high degree of confidence that they're going to get what they need. And, you know, there's that, there's that, um, there's that technical expertise, there's the quality assurance, there's being able to navigate all, all of that available to them. Because, you know, retrofits will then become the business of that agency and building owners can continue to do their jobs. Yeah, absolutely. So as you start to build out the structure of this, you know, there's some questions around like the costs of it, but also kind of the, um, some people are asking like how they can get involved. So how do you see this retrofit delivery center working with multiple partners? Is it kind of like a, like a committee that comes together based on each project or do you sort of act as a funnel to all the other partners? And then just your thoughts just on the mix of costs for doing something like this, like how much money goes into marketing versus incentives, staffing and that kind of stuff. Oh, all right. Now we're getting to questions for whom, which I have less and less answers. Um, I would be almost interested to know, and I don't know if this is like breaking the rules, Corey, but if people have ideas on different ways they would want to get involved, I would welcome them to put them in the chat and, and, uh, and take a look at that. Um, 
because you know our 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 motivation uh and this is, again is, is back to why we thought this has got to be an, an agency that's working in the public's interest is on getting the retrofits complete and seeing the carbon impact and the carbon reductions that we need to achieve that's the that's the bottom line for this uh for this agency yeah so yeah if people feel free to to put that into the chat um the good thing about this is that um a we don't have rules and if we did we'd be fine with breaking them so go right into the chat and start outlining it if you're an organization so let's say you work for a utility or you work for a um a trade association how would you want to get involved in the retrofit delivery center and feel free to put that in the chat or feel free to reach out directly to fatima because i think that those structures are being built now. And as um, you know, we see more and more federal government um, direction going to this and potentially money going and in, coming into the new year, you know, how we all work together is going to be as important as, you know, the money and, and, and the actual programs that get uh, delivered. So um, sounds like Fatima, you're open to kind of different ways that everybody can kind of figure out how to work together on something like this. The, the crux of the challenge is, is spurring the market along, right? Putting the money out there alone won't get the job done, and we've got sort of increased capacity to do it. But we need um, we need to move faster, and so that's why I sort of said that the agency would be nimble in responding to the next market need to just get this uh, to get this engine rolling. Just I just smiled at the use of the word engine. Uh, you know, over time, if the market's delivering, maybe the agency ceases to exist. You know, our our intention, there's no need to compete with what's already out there. What we're trying to do is increase access, increase speed, reduce barriers. Yeah, and I, that's actually one of the comments here from Mark Carver, who kind of outlines, you know, um, that a local delivery center is, you know, may make sense, but a coordinated kind of approach that builds markets is yeah. is what we're after, right? Mm -hmm. And there's also another question around how this could connect with other retrofit delivery centers or models. And I think that's, that's the crux of it, is that essentially what we're doing, all of us in this sector now, is we're creating a market. And creating a market means different actors kind of popping up based on market conditions. But if we're truly creating a sophisticated market, then we're actually listening to how they can work together to advance something like this. And so I think, Mark, you're, you're bang on with that question is how do these local centers sort of coordinate across jurisdictions? Certainly, um, you know, the LC3 network would be one place for that to happen. But I see that you know, there are already different forums for various different implementers of energy efficiency programs that could play in this space as well. And there's there's ways that we can leverage and Efficiency Canada as a place where we can help bring some of those folks together. But I think you're absolutely right. It's got to be a way for a market building exercise as much as it is specifically trying to do something just in the GTHA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, Megan Bennett, um, another old friend, asked, uh, uh, is just curious how, how you would integrate and st stack different incentives. So let's say you've got incentives from utility, then one level of government, another level of government, and then you throw in pace. Um, you know, how, how do you do that, um, you know, bringing in gas, electricity and stuff, and, you know, any thoughts on that? Hi, Megan. I, um, I don't know the answer to your question, but I do know who does. Um, I'll, uh, I'll talk to the team and I'll get you a, a good response on that. Great. Um, there are some questions around, um, uh, um, you know, timing um, and also kind of, you know, again, how people get involved. Do you have a sense of timing for the launch? And Erica Lontok from Enbridge also asked, just, um, just proposed geographical limits. So just to be clear, it, it's the GTHA for now. That's, that's your scope and then do you have a sense of timing i mean timing we're just trying to apply this thinking to our work right now like i said we're fundraising for the idea so that we can really put a team against this and do this in a in a sustained way i don't think you could build an idea like this and try it out in a year you really need that roadmap that that length so as you know we're fundraising for three years but because we've got retrofits underway right now and we're committed to the work we're also just trying to apply the scale thinking right now to the projects we have underway. So that's a complicated and long way of saying, let's start now. Um, and yeah, I spoke a lot today about the GTHA because that's the area that TAP is responsible to deliver these programs. But when we first did the initial thinking and when we think about it as a whole, I mean, we think about the whole country and we end so, um, you know, that's why I sort of respond to that. This is that if you if you feel that there are elements of this idea that resonate or that would be applicable, please take them. Great. 
Um, and uh, the other question I had uh, that I had written down, and Dorothy from HRAI brings it up, is just the, the, the value in working with contractor networks. So Dorothy McCabe is with uh, Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning Institute, HRAI. And, um, you know, they'd be interested, she says they'd be interested in working with you on this. Talk, talk to me about, or maybe just kind of describe how you see this playing um, like where this, where the work you're doing stops and where like a general contractor would come in, you know, on a major retrofit. And, and do you see yourselves kind of playing all the way through up until the final, like, you know, uh, the nail is, is hit in and, or do you see yourselves kind of playing more of an upfront role and, and just, yeah, the, just the, the role you play with the contractors? Yeah, I think it really comes down to that first principle, which is about service to the building owner and then also about playing to our strengths right we can't and don't need to do all of the work what we do want to make sure is that the building owner can access what they need and that we can deliver so we're bringing in a gc or you know what are the processes by which you know that the, that we're going to design and do all do all the design engineering to make sure that we get the maximum benefit out of the measures that are in there and then contracting out to general contractors and construction uh, organizations to do this. TAF is not positioned to do all of that work. What we are positioned to do and what, and what, what our mandate uh, requires us to do is to make sure that these retrofits hit a certain level of quality, hit a certain level of energy performance and carbon improvements. And that's what we, wanna, we don't wanna take our eye off of. That's the ally role that we play um, in this. Great, yeah, good point. Um, okay, so there's been a few kind of discussions and chats going on. Thank you, Julie from TAF, who's um, uh, provided a report in the q and I'll, I'll pop it into the chat that talks about stacking. So good on you, Fatima. You said you'd find the person and that person just quickly put a report in there and talks about stacking. So uh, I'll put that in the chat and have a look at it. Um, the next question um, that I wanted to ask comes um, from Kelsey uh, Chagas or Chigas. Um, and it's around social benefits and somehow sometimes there are trade-offs, you know, when you're going for deeper GHG reductions, you know, maybe you're increasing outdoor air in a building, which can increase energy use. And so just, she wanted to just learn a little bit more about your perspective on how to be accountable to more of the social outcomes related to this. And is there a framework or metrics that, that, you know, that help these project teams navigate those kinds of trade-offs and maybe through the TowerWise project, you saw something like that. You can, yeah. Yeah, there's a couple ways to answer that. One, for sure, we have to make it a priority, right? So we have to we have to stop taking it as like a choice, and we have to put this in as a strategic priority. Second, for sure, you have to look at the building level and the community level, what the needs are. You know, um, with the with the Towerwise project, the the project that I cited, if you go to taf.ca/retrofits, you can access a whole suite of our case studies. But in one of the buildings, one of the measures that was tested were smart thermostats. And smart thermostats became a viable measure to test, not just because of the energy savings promise that they brought, but actually because tenants also did not have control in their own suites over the heat. And through our benchmarking, we discovered that in the winter, tenants were living in temperatures of up to 28 degrees Celsius in the winter. So suddenly this measure becomes more than just an energy savings measure. It gives people independence and some choice over the quality of life and create some health improvements by being able to reduce the reduce temperatures, get people um, better sleeps. And when we did our post retrofit surveys, tenants reported higher quality of sleep, slower incidences of sick days and more productivity. And so um, there's there's diagnosing the needs and the priorities at the at the building and at the home level about what what the opportunities are and looking at the measures. And you know, sometimes we talk about, we really need to think about energy retrofits as more than energy, right? That might be the door that you're opening, but when you're in there, what are the other upgrades and improvements and repairs that need to get taken done? Because it will not be a more cost-effective time to do it than when you've already got the crews there and you're already in site. Yep, excellent points. Thanks for that. I think um, that's more that I learned from the folks in the EU at Energy Sprung, it's a shorthand that's really, really useful. And they talk about a no regrets approach uh, to, um, to, to retrofits, which is, you know, when you start to look at the measures that you're going to apply, you might not be able to get to the outcomes that you want to get on day one, but don't start implementing measures that are going to complicate your ability to get from a 20% reduction to a 40% reduction. And they always call it the no regrets approach. And I think that that's a smart way to put it. Yeah, great point. 
Um, one of the great things about this discovery session is that you don't have to answer all the questions. So if you're following the, the question, the Q&A uh, box, um, there's a robust discussion happening around PACE still. And then there was questions around the types of uh, regulations, both provincial and federal, that would help support something like this. And so a bunch of responses to that. So if you haven't already and you're listening in, just check the q and I'll leave that up. And there's some nice links in there that talk about um, complementary kind of um, regulations and things like that, as well as uh, things related to PACE. A um, couple more questions that are more like um, um, uh, specific, and if you know the answer, one of the questions from John was how many buildings are being retrofitted annually as it compared to your target of 44,000 uh, per year in the GTHA, or if you know the answer to that. No, I would love to know. I would love to know the speed we're moving at right now. It's 44,000 suites. Uh, to be specific, so that's um, in multi, like in multi-unit residential buildings. That's how many we'd have to hit. And we did that math, looking at 2020 to 2040, and trying to get to all of them. Uh, but no, I don't know. I don't know uh, how many we're doing today. But I know it's not that. It's not close enough. <laughs> it's not 44,000. That's for sure. Um, and then a uh, question around financing options, just, uh, you know, what, what, what's available now uh, to MERV? So uh, the question is kind of finance, but also funding. So we know that there's kind of um, various different programs that, that, let's say, utilities would run to help a, a MERV, you know, make, do the kinds of um, uh, feasibility studies and energy assessments and then ultimately the work. Uh, but uh, as far as financing goes, when you did the TowerWise project, were there, was there specific financing that you went after or is this another one of those policy recommendations that you're trying to pull together? I think the answer is both. I mean TAF because of our endowment fund we're able to support some of the financing, accessing financing uh, through, F uh, through CMHC and others and what we're definitely trying to do is increase the interest from the traditional lenders from the investment community and even at the community investment level. Um, some of the successful programs we've seen have achieved up to a 50-50 blend of private and public capital. And I think that there's opportunity in doing that. And that's what we're trying to do here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Um, so on the 44,000 question, uh, my colleague Brendan answered um, that we, you know, like you, we haven't seen data on like specifically on the multi unit and specifically on GTHA, but uh, we do know there's about a 1% retrofit rate in Canada. Um, that's on single family dwellings. So on the commercial floor area, it's about 1.4%. So um, I guess if you do the math on the 44,000, that's uh, still, as you said, quite a lot to go. Um, okay, last question was just, um, just making sure we had your contact info. I think there's been a lot of interest uh, in people wanting to help out and to learn more. And Great. so um, if you wouldn't mind maybe just putting it in the chat before we uh, sign off a, uh, just your email address. And the question from Bruce was whether or not this Q and A part was going to be recorded and yes, it is. So this is all part of the same recording. Um, so we have not been able to get to all the questions. Again, a great problem to have showing great interest. Sometimes we got to pull questions out of you. If we did not get to your question, please reach out directly to Fatima or myself. Uh, I'll put my email address in there as well. If people want to ask Efficiency Canada anything as well. So with that, we are at our time, 1245. Um, and I just wanted to, again, thank Fatima Kriar for an excellent presentation and getting people's thinking around, um, you know, this, this uh, model that TAF is creating. And it sounds like this is just the beginning. There's going to be a lot of follow up with you um, around it. And um, for those that would like to share the recording, we will have that out early next week and you can share that around into your networks as well. Um, and the last thing I will say is that we hope to see you all here next week um, where uh, I have the pleasure of hosting again. Um, and we will have Andrew Pride, um, who will be talking about a brand new report that he helped to write uh, with Efficiency Canada. Uh, on the tiered energy codes, best practices for code compliance. So uh, I would highly encourage people to check out this report. It's written in very accessible language. So if you've uh, been yearning for the opportunity to figure out how you're gonna get and learn more about building codes, this is your chance and come equipped with some questions next week. 
Um, and uh, hopefully we have a, a great robust um, uh, discussion then as well. So I will leave it at that. Thank you again, Fatima, for your time. And uh, thank you to everyone for sticking around and for joining the discussion. And uh, go forth and have a, an excellent, safe, and happy weekend. And we'll see you all next week. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for participating. <laughs>